Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Stephanie Wade, Executive Director of the Historic Arkansas Museum, and I'm so glad you could join us for our discussion today on the Arkansas Made Books. And let me just show you what those look like in case you have not been able to see them yet. Here is volume one and volume two. And as you can see, they are absolutely beautiful, hefty works. And before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Arkansas Department of Parks, Heritage and Tourism. I also wanna mention that our panelists will answer your questions in the last 15 minutes or so of the talk. And so if you could please type your questions in the chat as we go along, then we will answer them um, closer to the end. Um, I also added a link to purchase the Arkansas Made Books in the chat as well. All right, now let me introduce our wonderful authors and presenters. First, Swanee Bennett. Swanee retired as director and curator of the Historic Arkansas Museum in 2020 after a career at the museum spanning 38 years. He worked at Colonial Williamsburg prior to joining the museum, and Swanee is co-author of both Arkansas Made volumes. Jennifer Carmen. Jennifer is an independent art advisor and historian who is an accredited senior appraiser of American, British, and European fine and decorative arts. For 17 years, her Arkansas-based firm has provided advisory and valuation services to a national clientele. She has been researching and collecting the work of Arkansas artists for over 20 years, and Jennifer is a co-author of volume two of the Arkansas Made Books. Victoria Chandler. Victoria is the curator of collections at the Historic Arkansas Museum, and she has been with the museum for about eight years now. Mm -hmm. A graduate of Hendrix, and she also has her master's in public history from UA Little Rock. And Victoria was a key researcher on the Arkansas Made books, and she continues the work of Arkansas Made, curating its exhibits and programs. And let me mention that our fourth panelist, Bill Worthen, is unable to be with us today, but he very kindly passed along some remarks and comments that I will read throughout the talk. Um, but also, here's just a short bio on Bill. Uh, Bill Worthen retired as director of the Historic Arkansas Museum in 2016 after a 44-year career here at the museum. Bill is co-author of both Arkansas Made volumes, as well as a co-author of A Sure Defense, The Bowie Knife in America. So I'd like to kick off our discussion with a statement from Bill Worthen, and it's a really good starting point as to how the Arkansas Made program came about. Bill says, early in my tenure at the museum, this was in the 1970s, we were asked by a museum in Oklahoma to participate in a temporary exhibit of regionally produced historical arts. I remember feeling completely at a loss after I figured out what they really wanted. Our collection was oriented around an authentic presentation of antebellum life in Little Rock, with almost all of the objects being either related to old families or selected for their appropriateness in a domestic house museum setting. The location and manufacture was incidental. We welcomed the curator from Oklahoma who ended up with a couple of objects from our collection, including a wonderful cradle scythe, definitely not made in Arkansas. And my realization was twofold. We did not know enough about our collection and place of manufacture might be a factor of interest. When we started looking around, it turned out that no one knew much about local manufacture in Arkansas. It was as if there was a tacit acceptance in the state's academic world of the humble nature of Arkansas's mechanical, decorative, and fine arts. Perhaps it was not even worth studying, but because it already fit into our interpretive scheme, we began to delve into what we called the artisan period of Arkansas history. It became dependent on getting someone who knew what he was doing. And we found that person when Swanee Bennett came back to Arkansas from Colonial Williamsburg. And it turns out Swanee was getting some interesting feedback from some of his colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg regarding Arkansas's creative legacy or lack thereof. So as you can see, this statement from Bill takes us to the beginning of the Arkansas Made Project. And Swanee, I must absolutely go to you first as you were there in the beginning. Um, you're a <laughs> primary author on these second edition volumes as well as the first editions that were published in 1991 
And what did you think when Bill first reached out to you? Did you did you come straight to what was then called the Arkansas Territorial Restoration and, and just dive in immediately with uh, with the Arkansas made undertaking? Oh, hello. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Oh, good. Well, I, I, w I was at the museum. I, I worked at the museum before I went to Williamsburg. So when those folks from Oklahoma, it was a fellow who ultimately was going to write a book on folk art. And uh, I was there with Bill. And we both sort of began to become, to, be to become familiar with what was going on. And we learned about the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. And uh, that was focused completely, up in North Carolina, that was focused completely on studying the work of local artists and artisans. And uh, then it just sort of segued into me going to Williamsburg and working there for several years. And while I was at Williamsburg, uh, Bill and I kept talking. And I became intimately, on a day-to-day, -day, personally involved with researching local artists and artisans in the south, east of the Mississippi River. Through Colonial Williamsburg's efforts, all of the curators there were writing books on furniture and silver and paintings in the south. And we were friendly competitors with MESDA, the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts that I mentioned down in Winston-Salem, uh, that was being underwritten by the Cannon family from Cannon Towels and Textiles, uh, Frank Horton. And we got to know those folks. And so they had field researchers throughout the South, east of the Mississippi River. And we would visit with and study with and collect with all these people. So I was doing this on a day-to-day -day basis back in the 70s and early 80s when I was at Williamsburg. And I started calling Bill and saying, you know, we've got to do this. And Bill was saying, yeah, we've got to do this. So we had double concentric rings. You know, how did humanity begin? Well, Bill had one going on in Arkansas and I had one going on in Virginia. And the thing that really made me absolutely sure that I wanted to come back to Arkansas and work with Bill on this was I was doing research. Two things happened. I was doing research. Uh, Actually, we were meeting one evening at Colonial Williamsburg and all of us young curators were sitting around and our boss, the chief curator, uh, Graham Hood from England, was going around the room welcoming, welcoming us all and asking us questions. And he looked over at me in the best public school accent that an Englishman can have and said, well, Mr. Bennett, aren't you happy to be out of the backwater? And I'm from Lawrence County, the mother county of Arkansas. I cannot tell you how upset I was when he said that. And I, I didn't have an answer. So Graham had sent me to, to Winterthur Museum, the DuPont Museum, and he was doing a study on these Southern painters. And they had several of their works in their collection up at Winterthur in Delaware. So I found out that the director and chief curator at Winterthur was Dr. Charles Van Ravensway, who was from Missouri originally. So I got to meet him and we were sitting around. He was very friendly and very welcoming. And he said, well, how, how are things going down at Williamsburg with, with the grand Dr. Hood? And I said, oh, great. And I said, but Dr. Montgomery, you won't, uh, uh, Dr. Van Ravensway, you won't believe what he said to me. And I felt, you know, that we knew each other well enough after an hour's conversation, I could tell him personal things. And I said, Graham asked me how I felt to be out of the backwater. And he got mad. And he said, well, what you need to do is go back to Arkansas and get with your friend, Bill Worthen. And Dr. Fleming, Dr. Van Ravensway, I think, had met Bill. And he said, you need to write a book about Arkansas's material culture. And uh, that sort of sort of that was the spark that I needed. And uh, so we just sort of proceeded from there. We're so glad, so glad that you did. I'm this sorry is... for that long-winded answer. Oh my gosh, no, no, it's so interesting how it all how it all started. Um, and Victoria, as the current current curator of collections at the Historic mm -hmm. Arkansas Museum, uh, when did you first join the project, and and how were you involved? Yeah, so I first started in um, uh, 2013 um, as a graduate student, um, and I came and I was interning at HAM, um, but I quickly started assisting with the transcription of all the files that we have for um, 
all the Arkansas artists and artisans um, for the book. So, you know, it, at the back of each book, there's a hefty index of the makers. Yes. <laughs> um, and so those actually started with physical files um, that we've been taking notes for for decades um, and adding more information every time we find out something new. Um, and so we kind of had a standardized system for the indexes intended to be in the books um, that weren't were in the talks, um, but hadn't for formally started yet. Um, and so that's when I started and then became a full-time Arkansas made researcher uh, later that year. So, right, right. Yeah. yeah, major, major undertaking. Yes. Um, and Jennifer, you came in on volume two with the focus on photography and fine arts. Um, with your expertise in these fields, how were you recruited to join this, this project? Well, I met Bill and Swanee maybe 16 or 17 years ago, when I was uh, fresh home from a connoisseurship program that I had done with my master's degree. And I was looking for ways to use that. And I meeting them, I think was one of the best things that ever happened to me. At the time, they had a group of volunteers that were trying to assimilate information about artists and artisans working in Arkansas. And they had a bunch of volunteers that spent time at the History Commission. And I became one of those volunteers at the same time as I was setting up my own art advisory and appraisal practice. And over the years, I continued to volunteer and also do some work with the museum on various projects. And it became very clear quite quickly that I shared their obsession with Arkansas arts and that my work and their work really dovetailed nicely because at, you know, on one hand, they were interested in documenting these artists and artisans. And I, in the context of my work as an art advisor and appraiser was able to go into homes all over the state where I would often be shown works that were by artists I'd never heard of and that I discovered the museum had never heard of. And over time, I built quite a repository of my own files from those, you know, 15 years of, of time going into homes in Arkansas. And, you know, learning of artists that none of us knew about and keeping those records gave me something to sort of merge with their work when the time came. So, yeah, yes, it did. Definitely. Yeah, that, that's very valuable <laughs> what you were able to gather. Um, well, let me ask you all, with volume one's focus on quilts, textiles, ceramics, silver, weaponry, furniture, vernacular architecture, and Native American art, um, do each of you have a favorite object or work from this, this first volume? Oh, gosh. Ladies, do y'all want to go first? I, yeah, I've, I've got Jennifer, you want to go? Uh, sure, uh, I'll, I'll do this because I just have one object. I think Swanee has, a, <laughs> Swanee yes. has, Victoria has you queued up Swan with some yeah. images. Um, I'll start with the, with this chair that you can see on your screen. Uh, what I like so much about this object, this is a, a lounge chair designed by um, architect Edward Durrell Stone. And he, he became an architect of international notoriety, uh, but he was from Arkansas. And I think that this, chair really embodies the spirit of Arkansas made because it's a chair but it's designed by an architect but the seat was woven by a basket maker named George Harrison Gilbert in Springdale and it's made from oak strips from the Ozarks and so I think it really showcases the rich craft and design traditions from the state and it, I think it also serves as a good reminder of how materials and techniques of makers transcend uh, space and time because 5,000 years before this chair existed, indigenous people of Arkansas were weaving the trees and grasses and cane of the Ozarks. In the book, there's a, a, a if you buy the book, you'll see a beautiful uh, shoe mm -hmm. that is possibly 5,000 years old and it's woven of hickory. And I, it reminds me of this chair actually. And I think it's interesting mm -hmm. to think that when you fast forward to the 20th century, there's this chair <laughs> at mid-century. And then even today in the 21st century, we, you know, that tradition is still alive with basket makers like Leon Niehaus, if any of you know him. Yeah. Am, am I live? Yes. 
I, I, I want to remind, and Jennifer knows this too, but she was telling us so much that the, the legs on that chair are made out of plow shares, are made out of plow handles. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. Senator J. William Fulbright mm -hmm. was a partner with Stone, our senator, whose family owned a, uh, man a wagon manufacturing company up in Fayetteville. And they just repurposed their machinery to make some of this furniture. And so if you see the two back legs, how they're curved, those are plow handles. Yes, very much an Arkansas piece. <laughs> it's just, it's just wonderful how they adapted. It's, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Yeah. It's very it's exemplary. Mm -hmm. um, I shared a couple extra, because there's too many. It's like <laughs> picking your favorite child. Um, here um, we have a lovely grouping of Nilok swirl pottery. And Nilok, um, which is spelled um, Kaylin backwards for Kaylin Clay, is one of the most famous art potteries to come out of Arkansas. And he patented this squirrel invention, which is actually different layers of clay all blended together. Um, and then, of course, I've got, we've, there's this lovely necklace by Elsie Friend, who is a pioneer in modern jewelry making. Um, and this is actually from the Coop, Cooper Hewitt Museum. Um, and we tried to get a kind of an array of objects that are from um, not just historic Arkansas museums collection, but all over. And I think that's one of the exciting things about the books is that so we were able to document so many Arkansas made pieces, both in private and public collections internationally, which is just so thrilling. Um, the, here's are two of my favorite objects um, because they involve so much research and, and discovery of new artisans that we are constantly finding more about. Um, on the left is this lovely hunting horn. And so, you know, you sound the horn <laughs> to call the, the, the hounds. Um, and it's beautiful. It's got these, you know, beautiful buckle and um, at the bell opening and then um, this acorn at the mouthpiece. Um, and we actually discovered that there was a school of these hunting horn makers um, in Plum Bayou area um, of just outside of Little Rock. Um, and we discovered about six other horns that are all in similar style. Um, and so it's just a remarkable thing that we, we can attribute um, the maker. Um, we don't know definitively, but it was all made in the same style. And then to the right, um, it was this lovely, um, this is a ceramic piece made by Jacob Backley, who was a potter who came to Texarkana. And he was kind of like George Orr. He was known as the mad, um, the humbug <laughs> Jake Potter. Um, and this is actually, you might recognize this, this was on Antiques Roadshow the last time they were in Little Rock. Um, and it's this lovely whisk gouger with a snake coiling up. Um, and so we've been able to identify more works by him. And he was a previously unknown 19th century artist, um, which is, so that was very exciting. Swanee, you wanna talk about these? God, I, I just wanna to say too about Victoria and Jennifer, they brought us into the 20th century, the late 19th and 20th century without them. Uh, the, the new volume just couldn't have been done. What, what they've done is remarkable. Jennifer doubled the number of artists we knew about. Victoria found, really developed these horn makers and found Backley. I, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm always humbled when I look at these pieces and what they've done. Now, <laughs> these two pieces that you see, <laughs> the one on the left is a pair of sugar tongs made by a fellow named Silas Tracy Toncray. And he was a silversmith who arrived in Little Rock in 1821. And he arrived here at the same time his future nephew-in-law would get here. And his nephew-in-law was a fellow named William E. Woodruff, and he started a little paper called the Arkansas Gazette. And Woodruff married Toncray's niece, Jane Eliza Toncray Mills, on my birthday, November 14th, 1827. And this was a pair of sugar tongs he made as a wedding gift right here in Little Rock. And they have these, it's this wonderful strap-like tongue with the acorn finials. And uh, they're just exquisite. They're just exquisite, exquisite. And they have his touch mark on the inside, which is Eagle Rampant with his name arched over. And I could go on for an hour, but I want... <laughs> They're beautiful. Next to, beautiful. <laughs> thankfully for yeah. everyone. Yeah. And then next to that is, uh, uh, I'm having a hard time. Uh, uh, oh. Is that the glass piece? Yes, this is the Lafayette glass and Oliver Harris piece. Yeah, a Lafayette glass was a potter who worked around. He was in Arkansas. He worked down in Benton in that area of Saline County, or Saline County, as they used to call it. Um, 
and we like this pot for Victoria and I are especially fond of this pot. Yes. Uh, he at one time employed an enslaved man named Oliver Harris, who had been trained. I think we think that uh, Victoria's brought me to this. We think that Glass was probably more of an entrepreneur, a, 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 mm -hmm. a merchant. He may have been a potter too. We're not sure, but we think so. We think that he acquired the services. In other words, he purchased Oliver Harris out of New Orleans or Southern Louisiana somehow. And he got him to Arkansas. And we think that Oliver Harris probably is the maker of a lot of these pots that Lafayette Glass made and marketed. Mm -hmm. And we think, again, Victoria and I both, and I think it's Victoria that's brought me around. I, I think that Oliver Harris probably made this wonderful crock that you see here, which I think is a five gallon, but mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, it's wonderful. And it could be, it was a multi-purpose. It could be used as a churn or a storage vessel for, for lard or grease. But uh, it's just an example of how uh, African-American artisans were ever present throughout America and the South and uh, and uh, we constantly find, you know, we, we constantly find them there that we see them. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but they're all, but as usual, but as you might suspect, they're in the background, but they are definitely there. Yeah. And this piece is really interesting, too, because um, it kind of brings it's, you know, both. Um, it crosses both periods of the, um, you know, from cut off from 1870 up until the 20th century. Because piece, um, Lafayette Glass and Oliver Harris continued to make um, uh, functional pottery down in Benton. Um, and they're, Oliver Harris is actually living with Lafayette Glass in the 1870 census. And they're both listed, he's listed as the potter. Um, and so they continue making, and they're really one of the um, a handful of potters that really become the big Benton pottery scene. Um, yeah. and, and it's also of note, um, the Lafayette glass pieces are the only pieces that we have found in Arkansas that show examples of freehand cobalt decoration, um, which is really unique. You see that elsewhere in the country. Um, but this is, these are, we have two pieces now in the collection um, and those are the only two identified made by glass um, and Harris and so it's just really lovely to see that freehand um, yeah. decoration and creativity and these are these wonderful ovoid shapes um, mm -hmm. this yeah. you want, do, do, oh, is this the is this the Robertson rifle? yes yeah I think <laughs> Bill and Swanee picked like, the next okay couple. let me interject yeah. just yeah. briefly and and read a statement from Bill um, on this uh, because he, he certainly would agree with Victoria and then it's very difficult to pick a favorite um, because they are like children. But Bill said, I, I well remember Swanee bidding $3,000 on the Robertson rifle. I think we were in Lone Oak and getting it. Could he have just gone to 2,900? <laughs> I never was really good at bidding. I did do the bidding <laughs> on Bowie number one over the phone and that was a steal at 32,000. I always loved the secession quilt, only nine stars, and the three villages pawpaw robe, and the Dwight mission sampler. Yes, and it's funny, if you want to talk about the Dwight, I think this yeah, is one of the, the stars. Rifle. Yeah, the, the Dwight mission cover, or, uh, sampler is still one of the stars in our collection, and it's one of the best objects that has ever been made in Arkansas and that we still have. Um, so why don't you want to take it over? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, um, the, 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 it's, it was a sample. This is an 1828 sampler. It's, it's, uh, it shows the, it's really, it's the work of young women generally. That, those are the folks that made samplers and they practiced two things. Uh, they improved their abilities at domestic economy. In other words, housekeeping and house caring. So she was learning to sew at the same time. It helped make them more literate. It was an educational tool. She did her alphabet and she would do simple verse. Oftentimes it would be Bible verse. Uh, what makes this truly unique? And literally there were hundreds of thousands of these made throughout the United States during the first half of the 19th century and early and late 18th century. What makes this unique? It was made in Arkansas in 1828 by a Native American, Nancy Grace, at Dwight Mission, which was the Cherokee Mission near present day Russellville. It, it's the earliest known, as far as we know, among sampler scholars and, and early Native American scholars that deal with Native American historic material culture. 
It's the earliest known Native American made sampler in existence. I saw it about 40 years ago at a show, uh, in, a, in, a, in a show catalog. It was in an early catalog, uh, not for sale, but just being exhibited by a lady named Edmondson out in California. And have wondered where it was ever since. Well, we had a chance to get it. And I want to tell you, this is one of the good stories that I get to tell because I'm old. It's, it's I was sitting, and believe this or not, I was sitting in a duck blind at our farm, at Bennett Farm, uh, late in duck season, and I got a phone call from Sotheby's in New York that said, was I ready to bid online? I had forgotten the sale was that day. So I'm sitting in a duck blind, duck blind when this young lady, who was obviously well-trained, probably tra like Jennifer, trained in London in the Christie's or Sotheby's graduate program, and, she's, and she could hear gunfire. And she, she asked me, she said, Mr. Bennett, where are you? And I said, I'm sitting in a duck blind. And she told the auctioneer this, and you could hear this laughter going on in the room. Well, laugh as they may, we got that darn sampler. Yes. I don't want to tell you how much it is. I'll leave that up to Director <laughs> Wade if she decides to tell you. But uh, uh, we got that sampler. And I thank God we did because otherwise it would have gone either out of the country mm -hmm. or to a casino in northeast in the northeastern United States. Mm -hmm. And I'm pleased to say we've gotten this one. And Victoria did a great job writing about it in the book. And uh, thank goodness the museum, thank goodness to the Arkansas Natural Cultural Resources Council grants mm -hmm. that we were able to get this and the Loughborough Trust. So uh, yes, that's all yes. I got to say about that. It's very special. Mm -hmm. um, and the robe there is, <coughs> excuse me, we know this robe. This is a buffalo robe. And believe it or not, folks, uh, buffalo were indigenous to Arkansas up until the, to the early 19th century. And uh, this is probably an Arkansas buffalo. And what, I, we need Judge Morris Arnold here because he's the one that sort of found it for us to find. It belongs to the Musée de Lome, or was the Musée de Lome. It's now the Musée d'Orsay, I believe, in Paris. They've combined their museums. And it's a robe depicting Arkansas Post before 1749. And it's just amazing. It and is. Bill and I were fortunate enough to be able to borrow this robe. The museum was able to get this robe on loan from the museum back in the 90s and bring it to America for the first time since it went to France probably sometime around 1749 or 1750. And uh, it was in the King of France's collection. And it depicts the post of Arkansas and Ugapa um, Indians. One of the reasons... Yeah, one of we wanted to reasons we wanted to expand the books um, is that we wanted to include more Native American um, examples of art. Um, you know, Quapaw or who we get the name Arkansas from, um, and then we also wanted to bring in more uh, in, on vernacular architecture. Um, and vernacular architecture, of course, has connections to furniture making and woodworking and other tr trades that we have already covered. Um, so that was an exciting addition. Yes. Yeah, and again, I, I thank Victoria for being one of the person that really pushed for us to include uh, new chapter chapters we hadn't included before on vernacular architecture and Native American material culture. But it's a great yes. robe, yeah, and we beautiful. were able to borrow. Just beautiful. Um, a Vic okay, Victoria, does that as far as your slides that's, go yeah, for that's this? Yeah. Okay, well then, then let me switch gears then to volume two. Uh, with its focus on photography and fine arts, um, did you all think the production of this volume was very different from volume one? And then Jennifer, as a second question to you, um, in joining Swanee and Bill as a primary author on this second volume, um, what was your research process like in locating these Arkansas artists? I would say that 15 years ago, the research focus was very driven by uh, the microfish census data, uh, you know, we were, we were combing census records and reading 19th century newspapers, you know, using microfish and microfilm. And we were looking for tradesmen at that time who identified themselves as 
maybe cabinet makers or marble cutters or sign painters who were advertising their services. And in the 19th century, especially in places like Arkansas, artists and makers didn't really conceive of themselves as artistic visionaries that were creating, you know, sharing ideas or whatnot in the way, quite the way we think of artists today. They were really tradesmen who might have made furniture and coffins and painters who painted portraits and commercial signs that were the sides of carriages or whatnot. So I would say that the volume one research, especially the 19th century materials, the research was really driven by that sort of data and was very object driven because for so many of those objects, we don't know who made them. When it comes to the fine art and photography volume, I'd, and also as you bring it into the late, into the 20th century and the late 19th century, I would say that there is a lot more, there, there are more avenues for the research. So for instance, rather than just relying on days at the History Commission, reading old newspapers or looking at census data in that way, I would say that right now the internet really revolutionized the type of research that was possible for that volume. Because not only was I able to draw on the records that the museum had from their decades of research and also my own files, but also I discovered newspapers.com that allowed me to search with some keywords. And it's kind of, you know, we, we, Swanee and Victoria and I joke that when I discovered newspapers.com, it was just, you know, a revolution, but it really was. It is amazing. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. I mean, it is amazing. I'm addicted. <laughs> and also, you know, the art world of Arkansas, especially in the first half of the 20th century, almost nothing happened that wasn't newsworthy. Every exhibition and competition and classes and art related events and scholarships appeared in the newspaper. And also in the course of my work, I have examined probably 30 decades of auction records, trying to find traces of works offered at auction in the United States in the last three decades that have any reference to Arkansas or an artist linked to Arkansas. And I actually found quite a number of people that way. That's amazing. Yeah, very interesting. Um, Victoria or Swanee, did you all think it was was a different process at all? No, yeah. I mean, if 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 Jennifer and Vic had not come onto the program, it, it just wouldn't have been done. It was it was too much work for. Mm -hmm. I mean, Bill and I were only directing and curating. You know, we <laughs> new things were happening. We facility facility power available, and thank goodness two ladies came along and 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 uh, and other folks too and i want yes. you know caroline yes um yeah. Miller, other folks came along mm -hmm. and uh, made uh, and jennifer on the lead with the volume two and without jennifer we just wouldn't have their volume two wouldn't have been done couldn't have been done she yes. doubled she literally took us from four or five hundred artists to over eleven hundred mm -hmm. Yeah, Way to I go, think Jennifer. <laughs> it's amazing. It's just it's 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 in addition, it's it, hard to believe one or two people did that. Yeah. And thank goodness for the internet and newspapers.com and ask art and and then all of uh, Jennifer has so many contacts in the art world that uh it, it's just and but of course we had to pay her a lot of money to get her to do it. But uh <laughs> And I'm joking. We did. And thank goodness it was. Uh, and she is the super volunteer. Yeah, it was scholar. great. Arkansas made researchers. Um, we've been, you know, for 40, year, 40 plus years, we've had Arkansas made researchers. So it's not just been me and Jennifer with Swanee and Bill. Um, we've had a multitude of people who we all mentioned in the books yeah. um, and the acknowledgments. But one of the persons who's not here, but who was these books wouldn't have happened without her is Caroline Miller. Um, and she really put her, um, the drive to make everyone write and commit, um, and also edit and, you know, have a more succinct voice throughout the, um, works. Um, yeah. she was just, 
Caroline, yeah, Caroline was seminal to it. She absolutely. And she's Vicks also are, a major Vicks contributor. Moved into her place, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I only took over for the editing, and I think that is something. You know, the difference between these two volumes. A big thing is that unlike. Um, you know, volume one, um, we only have a small section for the fine art that's unidentified. And so the rest of it, it's identified with makers and artis artists. And so it makes much more sense. You know, we switched the layout from an essay to a catalog to being the essay and catalog are kind of combined because, and with the index as well, because the index is just, um, mm -hmm. we wanted to provide biographical information and what Jennifer wrote is just so incredible. and such a, yeah. a wonderful resource. I constantly, even though I, you know, I work on Arkansas, Maine, I constantly pull out the books for references mm -hmm. um, because it's just such a good resource. Um, well, before I ask you um, if you have a favorite artist from this volume or work from this volume two, let me uh, also interject another statement from Bill um, regarding the creation and expansion of the second editions of Arkansas Made. Uh, Bill says, of course, the artisan period of Arkansas history might have worked for the museum house interpretation, but Arkansas creativity refused to be so confined. We continued to collect and document our creative legacy into the 20th century, inspired by the success of the first Arkansas made volumes. Our departmental leadership, our commission, the Ham Foundation, and our supporters welcomed the expansion of our mission to bring Arkansas made up to date. Our mission became something like Arkansas's frontier period and its creative legacy. I might mention here that Winona Fay and Gordon Hull, King collectors, regular volunteers, and fabulous human beings whose collection became a foundation of our 20th century acquisitions. They, with gentle persistence, helped lead us into the modern era. And while the entire Ham Commission was ever so supportive, I think fondly of Charles Witzel, whose advocacy for Arkansas made never faded. I also feel the need to offer a disclaimer. My personal involvement in the production of the content of the second volumes was minimal. Swanee and Jennifer and Vic did a monumental job of bringing us up to 1950. And they let me continue to do a little research and to continue to acquire. I was our guy on eBay, but the presence of my <laughs> name on the cover <clears throat> is both a high compliment to me and something of a ruse on the unsuspecting public. For example, the appendixes continue to offer me rich surprises, diversion, and entertainment. And if I had labored to produce such content, I'm sure I would have less enthusiasm towards it. <laughs> um, okay, so let me, I, oh gosh, I don't want to run out of time on all our yeah. things we want to do. Um, so yes, please share a favorite maybe that you all have of uh, volume two. Yes, yeah, so Swanee and Jennifer, we'll go these, through these kind of quickly. Um, because we included a lot. Yeah, um, yeah. So one of, um, these are some of my favorites. Um, on the left is um, a photograph of a sculpture in butter um, done by Caroline Shock Brooks, who is kind of a famous pioneer in the sculpting field. Um, and then in the middle, another pioneer is uh, Ginny Deloney who helped establish uh, collegiate art in the state. Um, and to the right is a wonderful piece by um, Patrick Henry Davenport um, painted of Judge Jesse Turner in 1839. Um, and so it's just a nice wide array of kind of um, highlights from the 20th century um, of really just beautiful works. And they're just, I mean, they're just so beautiful. Like <laughs> they're bringing- Albert, a Albert, face. I called most forgetful in Arkansas. Yeah. And then Jennifer. Oh, so on the left, you'll see there a, a painting by an artist named Homan Quinn. And he, at the time this painting was painted in 1940, he was a Chinese immigrant who had been living in St. Louis, but he had come to Arkansas. And he painted this uh, local boy at the plantation commissary in Deshay County, Arkansas, where he operated a little grocery store. Um, and so that, at least that's what the census data of that year suggest. I don't know if this painting was in the store he was operating or mm. a different, different, sh different location, uh, but I've always loved that painting. Mm. And on the right is uh, probably one of my favorite Arkansas landscapes, and it is actually titled Arkansas Landscape. <laughs> and it is by an artist named Everett Spruce, 
who is today the most commercially successful artist to have been born in Arkansas. He is known as a, a Texas regionalist that's a part of the Dallas Nine. Uh, and I just like this 1938 canvas. I think it's, I like the modernist sensibilities and I think it really captures the beauty and mm -hmm. stillness of his native state. Mm -hmm. And on the left is another favorite of mine. This is a self portrait of, uh, of Jenny Deloney. And at the time she painted this portrait, she was little more than 30 years old and had returned from studying in Paris in the early era of she was one of the first women to gain admittance to study alongside men in Paris. And she also at that time was opening her own art school downtown in Little Rock at the Masonic Temple. And the next year she would go to Fayetteville to start the arts program at what became the U of A by the end of her tenure. Mm -hmm. um, and to the right is this wonderful photograph that we have that we're really lucky to have. Um, and it's actually on an exhibit right now at, at the museum, but it's um, a fair type of an enslaved nursemaid holding one of the children of Chester Ashley. Um, and so it's really remarkable kind of snapshot in time. And I love this photograph so much because um, the enslaved nursemaid who we don't know her name, um, she's the one in focus. And so she really dominates the photograph and it's really a portrait of her, which is just so lovely. Um, we have a few more. These are Swanee's favorites um, of Wode Muster. Hey, Swanee, are you there? <laughs> this is lovely. Um, on, in the right-hand corner, it's this view of Hot Springs um, done in 1865 of Dylan Kennedy, who were two local photographers. Um, and this pencil drawing is by Alfred Wode, who was a um, uh, drawer and um, artist who was here during the Civil War capturing scenes of Arkansas and the troops. Um, and this is the day of mustering out of Little Rock. Um, and it's all uh, a colored inventory that he's captured here, um, which is what he describes on the back. Um, and it's just a remarkable snapshot in time um, in, in Arkansas's history and really lovely. Um, we also have here on the left, just quickly, um, this work by George Catlin, who of course is a famous artist documenting um, Native American tribes throughout the United States, but he actually came and stayed in Arkansas for a very long time, um, or at least in terms of his travels, and he was working out of Fort Gibson and Fort Smith, um, and here he captured the Choctaw chief um, known as Snapping Turtle. Um, and then to the right is one of the new artists we discovered for these books, which was very exciting to hear. Um, he is the first um, Black political cartoonist um, in the nation named Henry Jackson Lewis, H.J. Lewis. Um, and he actually, um, he was born in slavery in Mississippi, but then came to Arkansas. And he's done a very sketching through um, a Native American um, documentary trip, but also um, through Loose Records, he worked at um, the Arkansas Gazette at some point and acquired some mentors there and learned some more um, cartoon drawing skills. And then these were Bill's favorites. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Which um, are, are just, beautiful. Yeah. Well, yeah. And let me, yes, let me um, add this statement from Bill um, with regard to, yes, favorite works. Bill says, over the years, I felt like we developed personal relationships with some of these artists. One was Henry Bird. We watched him as he moved around Arkansas. We collected examples of his work and it, as it evolved. And then we got to the most, the almost photographic quality of some of his New Orleans portraits after the Civil War. These personal relationships included getting to meet some of his descendants and ultimately amassing the best collection of his work anywhere. It's been fun to document the work of people I have known all of my life, the Brewer family in particular, and others such as Howard Simon, Howard Bragg, Josephine Graham, and Thomas Hart Benton, and so many wonderful surprises, a great legacy of Arkansas. Yes, yeah, so I, I guess the one on the left is, is Brewer, a yes. Brewer. Yes, it's um, uh, Adrian. A Petty G, yeah, a Petty G Mountain. 
And then um, on the right is uh, the Judge Byers family um, from Batesville, and it's by Henry Bird. And this is really a remarkable piece. It stands at, um, it's well over five feet tall. Um, it's a massive monumental piece, but it's really remarkable because in the upper right-hand corner, it captures um, the earliest known image we have in Arkansas of an enslaved person or a person of color. Um, the, we know that the family had enslaved individuals, which is why we're ascribing um, that that status. Um, and so it's just really remarkable for a myriad of reasons. Um, this portrait is also, um, Bird kind of gets highlighted in New York and on the Eastern Seaborn through various social circles. And it's because of this painting um, that people have talked about. Mm -hmm. It's really special. Yeah. Yes, it is. So is it the, all, of, all the pieces from volume okay. two? Okay, yeah. well, let me, let me ask one more, one more question before we move on to um, some Q&A yeah. with the audience. Um, what did each of you enjoy most about creating these fabulous publications? And Victoria, mm -hmm. let me pose a second question to you. Um, with the Arkansas made torch having been passed to you, um, how do you feel about the continuation of this important work moving forward, um, the future of Arkansas made? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll answer the second part first. Um, the I, coming in on the Arkansas made project was just so exciting because you're so quick to realize how important Arkansas is in the national um, artist scene and how important it is to art, just art history in general. Um, and how many people also came to our state and were inspired by it. And whether they were here for a week, a day, um, or decided to spend their life here, um, Arkansas and the people here impacted them and their work. Um, and so it's just so lovely. And I'm con it's a constant surprise of new discoveries. Um, and so it's really exciting. And I'm just so thrilled. I think one of the most important things about these works is that it just really captures Arkansas cre Arkansas's creative legacy. And um, that's you know part of our mission that we mentioned before, but it really is so important. Um, and you know, wonderful work was created here and still being made here. And it's so exciting that we get to share that um, with the world. So it was, mm -hmm. that was really cool. Uh -huh. Jennifer, do you want to Jennifer or yeah. Swanee? Uh, I would say that during the course of the research, it was the, the new discoveries that kept me going. Mm -hmm. But when I reflect on it now, now that I've had a few months to kind of hold the books in my hand, what I really am so pleased about is that I feel like the books gave and, and this all these years of research have give, given us the opportunity to work toward a more expansive vision of the creative legacy of the state mm -hmm. it's more inclusive mm -hmm. um, because yes. I think you know the first volumes as as wonderful as they are uh, they were by and large presenting objects made predominantly by white males and there were 38 artists three of whom were women and you know, these volumes, they're still embarrassingly too few of many of the artisans that whose work I wish we could see. Uh, but also we have, you know, expanded it greatly. I think now more than 40% of the artists in the book are women. And I just, you know, to me, that is upon reflection, the thing that makes me very excited about this process and more very hopeful about what the future can look like as far as the research that continues on after 1950. And, uh, you know, I just want to say too, I don't, I can't speak for everybody, but I know deep down I kind of can. Working on this project has been such a joy to work with such esteemed colleagues and to be entrusted with such special mm -hmm. research. This is, this is Swanee and Bill's baby, if mm -hmm. you will. And for, I have been very close with very incredible people who have researched this project. And th this will go down in history as I think one of the greatest honors and joys of my life. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very special. Thank you. <laughs> can you hear me, Stephanie? Yes, yes, I can. Can I say just a few words, which seems Please. impossible? Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I want to say this. I, I think the thing now, as I become a senior citizen and getting older, and I think back on all we've done and all the people that I've gotten to work with, I think one of the most charming and the most lasting 
memories and 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 efforts was the chance to meet these families. I, I can't tell you how many living rooms I sat in, mm -hmm. uh, how many storage buildings I went to, a few barns. And you'd sit there and you'd listen to these folks talk about their art or their objects. And for example, the, the portrait there of uh, Mrs. William Byers and her children from Batesville painted in 1842 by Henry Bird. I met the owner of the painting. And the little girl in the foreground, if that image is still up, was his great-grandmother. He knew her. Mm -hmm. Henry Lynn lived down in Columbus, Mississippi. And I went there as a kid. He was friends with my grandparents. And this portrait hung in his parlor, in his living room, in his house in Columbus. And I was probably 11 years old. And... We end up with a painting. I, I don't know how that magic happened, but we did. And I got to know the family. Are the portrait here, are, are the, the, the landscape of uh, by Adrian Burr? Well, all of us, Jennifer, Vic, certainly WB, I call Bill Worthen WB for <laughs> William Booker Worthen, but WB and me all know the Brewer family. We've known them personally for decades. And, you know, and the care and love that all these people have for what they're giving you mm -hmm. and occasionally selling you is, is just, uh, there's no price. And that's what I remember. It, it, it's so many, uh, in meeting, you know, Mrs. Averill Tate, it was the descendant of Woodruff where we got so many of our things from William Woodruff's family, or you go to Batesville or Fayetteville and actually meet one of the descendants of a cabinet maker or South Arkansas, or you meet Jenny Deloney's descendants, you know, one of our great 20th century women artists or late 19th century too. And we got to meet all these people. I, I, that's another book, just their stories. And Bill has just absolutely millions, of, you know, not millions, of, but lots of stories. <laughs> lots of stories. And I love that picture of all of us under that barn with Parker Westbrook down in yeah. Nashville, Arkansas. That, that was the beginning. That showed us all at the beginning. It's a, and it's there we a were. Fantastic and photo. That's wonderful. That's that's Bill on the left. That's Kathy Worthen. That's Rita Anderson, who was our education person. That's Parker Westbrook, who was Senator Full, J. William Fulbright's chief of staff for many years and later a member of our commission and founder of Preserve Arkansas. That's me standing there, believe it or not. <laughs> and one of our earliest Arkansas made researchers was Ann Guthrie standing in front of me, holding onto that, that post. Anne would later be with me in Williamsburg. And Anne was the coordinator of the first Southwide painting research program at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. She was the paintings coordinator for that seminal program. And she was one of our first Arkansas made researchers. And she's alive and well living in New Orleans today. Mm. So there we were. That was a motley crew. No, that was a, 1976. A, a good looking crew for sure. Cool. Um, yeah, that's Thank all. You. I know it's so yeah. special. It really is. And let me, uh, let me jump in here on some questions from the audience. Um, I know I feel like we could just talk about all these fabulous things. Um, but I want to get to some of these. Um, let's see. And Mark asked, um, if we will be seeing a post 1950 volume. My research but, continues. I'm I think so. so. <laughs> I have been, I mean, the research that I have been gathering the last 15 years certainly extends past 1950. So I, I've, I'm, I'm already on the way, I would say. Yeah. Well, and that yeah. ties in with the question from Tori about do you all track modern artists, those born after 1950, or is there kind mm -hmm. of a cutoff? Yes. So, I guess. Um, there's, um, you know, I think one of the difficulties of making, um, of, editing ourselves with these new publications that we have so many artists who are just on the cusp of 1950 that we wanted to include. And so that was really difficult. And so we do track um, artists up till present day here at mm -hmm. Historic Arkansas Museum. We have a contemporary gallery space where we try to collect a piece from just about every show. Um, but we also um, document the artists who exhibit there who are making work in the state. So uh, Stephanie, could I add yeah. one thing? Oh my gosh, yes, of course. Uh, <laughs> The, the, uh, the museum operates the oldest gallery dedicated to the works of Arkansas artists in Arkansas. 
and it's called our Arkansas Artist Gallery. And that's where we have rotating shows of active working artists in Arkansas. We opened that in 1973. Even the Art Center doesn't. We are the oldest gallery. We, have, we, we operate the oldest gallery in Arkansas, the longest serving gallery in Arkansas, dedicated to the work of just Arkansas artists uh, to date. And so I've always been proud of that. And I want to thank, you know, Peg Smith, one of our early commissioners, mm -hmm. and Bill Worthen, uh, Bill, Bill and, and Peg uh, were the genesis. And, uh, and again, many thanks to Peg is no longer with us, uh, but many thanks to WB for, for uh, making all of that happen. happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and of course, you all are receiving numerous compliments about how fantastic these books are and how wonderful the photo is uh, yeah. of, of you, Swanee and Bill and the early crew on the porch there. And, and I want to thank, yeah. too, uh, again, back to, I want to thank Victoria once again. She and Caroline Miller and Jennifer, I'm pretty much, work closely with the University of Arkansas Press, and we owe them a debt of thanks, too, uh, for putting together and, and designing the book and putting it together. Um, it was just, uh, it could not have been done without Victoria's leadership in the, in, in the, you know, assembling of all of this data and making it such an attractive product. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The covers. I know they look fantastic. Yeah. We fought hard for those covers and um, we really wanted them to signal kind of bringing up to the 1950 with the works by Elizabeth Hanna, who's a lone oak artist um, working in the 1940s and 50s. And then that, that Edward Durrell stone chair. Um, and I think part of the great things about these books is that while they are so rich in um, this history and that they're very you know they're scholarly works they're also beautiful and so we really wanted to create something that people would be proud to display on their homes on their coffee tables um to gift to people you know as like a welcome you know for people who move here or who miss the state um it's just such a great representation of all things arkansas and so we're really proud of how how beautifully designed these works are and we really owe it to the press to working with us to really yeah. make that come through they are, they are fabulous. And just in looking through some of the other questions, we kind of touched on them as we were going through the presentation. So I feel like, um, I feel like we covered most of that. And I apologize if we um, overlooked anyone here on any of the comments, but since we just have a few minutes left, um, I just want to say thank you all. Um, it, you all have clearly demonstrated the works of Arkansas artists and artisans are certainly worthy of study <laughs> and admiration and reflection. Um, so thank you to our authors and presenters, to Swanee and Victoria, Jennifer, and of course, we missed having Bill uh, with <laughs> us, but greatly appreciate his submitted comments. Um, thank you again to our sponsor, the Arkansas Department of Parks, Heritage and Tourism and also to the Six Bridges Book Festival for hosting such a fantastic event. Um, remember, you can purchase uh, mm -hmm. these Arkansas made books using the links that were put in the chat or by going to the CALS Six Bridges uh, Book Festival website. Um, we appreciate all of you, our audience, for, for joining us today and um, hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you.